Bloom, Buddhist Reflections on Serenity and Love by Ajahn Sona. Chapter 15, A Year of Metta. Well, believe it or not, I'm not quite finished with metta. The older I get, the longer I talk about love, because I realize there's a lot that hasn't been said about how to do this and how to maintain this. Unless you're in a retreat situation where you have nothing else to do, you can't be thinking, may I be well, happy, and peaceful. May all beings be well, happy, and peaceful. Or reciting the Metta Sutta all the time. You can't be muttering this to yourself, or having a distracted memory thing, or an inner recitation going on all the time. At what point do you stop doing that? And when you stop, what then? How do you manage to take this into life? How do you walk around in loving kindness? First of all, you can initiate loving kindness in the morning when you get up. You need to develop a formula for yourself. And it doesn't have to be a recitation of the Metta Sutta, although that might be fine. You have to find a little form that is not just a formula of words, but is perhaps a series of images so that the feeling is actually there. When you get up in the morning and you're in this feeling of loving-kindness, you don't have to be in a state of deep trance, of jhana. You're not going to be brushing your teeth and walking around in jhanas. You're going to be in your pajamas. But certainly, you're still able to have a loving attitude. So first thing in the morning, you check yourself over for what's present in you. Am I a little burdened? Am I cheerful? What's going on with me? Am I irritated? If you're recognizing that the hindrances are present, then metta is not. You have a duty to say, okay, I have to let go of these negative and worried sorts of states. Notice that in the Eightfold Path under Right Intention, there are three right intentions, non-ill will, non-cruelty, and renunciation. Non-ill will is, of course, the absence of ill will. It isn't specifically formulated as love. Metta, of course, does have right intention, but metta is just one form of non-ill will. There are many forms of non-ill will. So at the very minimum, you are proceeding into the day with the right intention of non-ill will. So you begin by checking yourself over for the presence of ill will in all its varieties and colors and tastes. Boredom is a form of aversion and therefore ill will. All the negative structures that don't feel good are forms of ill will. Even thoughts like, I can't wait for that coffee, could be ill will. Start at the baseline, at least devoid of ill will and the other types of hindrances, worry and anxiety and agitation. Now, if you think this process has to take an hour or an entire retreat, then you have to work out a more condensed form. This is the kind of thing that can be done, they say, in a finger snap. The Buddha says to the monks, if you can manage to get metta for a finger snap, then the alms that you are given, the support structure that you are given, has now been discharged. Your debt has been discharged. It's possible in a finger snap. That's powerful, isn't it? At the baseline, we take a little time, maybe a few minutes, taking a second for a deep breath and say, okay, why would I not wish that all conscious beings be well, including myself? What possible reservation could I have? What possible reason could I have for not allowing that to appear? There's just no reason, considering the situation for a living being in this universe, with all its mysterious and unknowable aspects. Any being, perhaps excluding a Buddha, is somewhat at a loss. We're lost children in the human realm, maybe more in the human realm. Because we have a sophisticated thought process, we're lost to some degree. Who doesn't have empathy for a lost person? a lost child. So we drop the ill will. 
Considering all the beings that behave in a reprehensible way, there's always reasons behind it. Primarily, they just don't know any better. There has to be some element of forgiveness there. The right thing to do is to forgive, including ourselves, including our past. Don't spend a lot of time on this. It doesn't have to be worked through carefully. It's not the Nuremberg Trials. Your life is not going to be carefully weighed by a jury. It's just that you're off the hook. The Buddha said so. I trust the Buddha. I'm off the hook. Then the Buddha invites you to have a nice café au lait with him. That is a warm welcome into the morning. To come to good-heartedness. It doesn't have to be extraordinary or dramatic. You find the relaxation which that emotion brings up. It brings a softening to the face. One of the benefits of loving kindness is your countenance is pleasant. Your face relaxes. The muscles relax. And you look as good as you can look. He doesn't say everybody's beautiful. He just says, whatever countenance you have, it will be as good as it can be at that moment. You're trying to induce this. Get back in touch with it. Remember what it feels like. It doesn't take much. This is changing the set point in the morning. Then you carry it through the day. If you start to lose it, you feel the hindrances creeping and you say, I've lost my metta. You take a breath and relax your face and remember the image that helps you trigger it. If you're an abstract sort of person, it might be just a vast sense of the situation for living beings in the universe. If you're a particular type person, maybe you have to think of a certain individual that reduces your worries and hostilities. You feel a sense of warmth. These are little triggers which you should get good at using and checking in with. You can make yourself a determination, which I highly recommend, to do metta for an entire year. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't have a conversation with anybody and that you're preoccupied with nothing but metta and you can't make eggs in the morning. It's got to be kind of in the background and brought forward every day for a year. You will be transformed. You will never again be the same person if you actually take that up seriously and say, my sadhana, my spiritual exercise for this year, is to abide in profound friendliness. And the deeper, the better. The more you do this, and the more often you can enter it, and the deeper you can get it, it's transformative. The Buddha is often saying, I have monks and nuns who dwell in this day and night. They live this way throughout their whole lives. You have to have a default mode. You've got to be feeling something. You've got to be somewhere. And five of the defaults are not available to a good Buddhist. That is, the five hindrances are not options. So if we're not going to dwell there, where are we going to dwell? Metta is a great option for just carrying around, especially towards evening, moving towards sleep, so that it pervades the dreams. We talked about nightmares and stuff the other night, but it's a very interesting experiment to see if you can induce beautiful dreams. You should be kind of eager for that as well. Take a whole year and say, for the last hour before bed, I'm going to spend an hour bringing up positive things and dropping negative things. See if this affects your dreams. You can even keep a journal, a dream book, on the quality of your dreams. This is a possibility of affecting the mind 24 hours a day, and it's something that doesn't wear out. You won't get tired. At the end of the year, you won't say, okay, enough of this love stuff. Let's get back to some hostility here. It just won't happen. It's finally the perpetual motion machine. I had this revelation that it's similar to living off-grid with a generator, solar panels, and a battery bank. Maybe I thought of this because it was raining today and our batteries were getting down, so I turned the generator on. I realized that's what happens with metta. When there's no sunshine, your batteries are getting low. You're starting to slip. The sunshine is when the metta is sustained and you're able to carry it. 
But there are times when the environment around you tends to be a bit deprived. You're in traffic. It's not going anywhere. You can feel your battery. Your metastructure is declining. The natural environment around you is not enough to help uplift you. Then you have to turn the generator on. Don't let it go down below 80%. It's hard on your batteries. You get the best bang for your buck if you don't go below 50%, actually. So you have to check every now and then, is the level adequate? If it's okay, at least non-ill will, you're in the zone. But every now and then, you have to generate. That means you specifically go back to the very idea to formulate it and repeat it, accompanying it, perhaps, with a change of facial expression. Sometimes you have to do bodily gestures first for the mind to remember what it feels like. Athletes do this all the time. They go through the motions with their body to remember what it feels like. So too, you can change the expression on your face and you'll be surprised at how it works. Now, don't do this one at the office, but in privacy or in the forest, you can use the bodily gestures of St. Francis. You should have a bag of tricks, maybe a few photos on your cell phone of Mother Teresa looking at a child or something like that. Something that triggers the warmth of metta. That's why people carry these photos around. They look at those dear to them and it cheers them up. Don't hesitate to use that. Put that in the meta scrapbook you're making. Collect any lines, poems, phrases, pictures, snippets of somebody talking, and have it available to help trigger meta when you need it. You have a whole range of techniques that help to restore the feeling, and they punctuate the day. When you get the opportunity, see how far you can carry it. Every now and then, you'll have a morning or evening meditation where you have nothing else to do. See how deeply you can go with this. If it's very, very joyful, you might get tears. Don't be too shy about trying to induce that sense of joy and good-heartedness that can bring a few tears. Tonight, we recited the four foundations of mindfulness. Right effort is simply a formulation of what you're about to do with mindfulness. It guides and corrects your mindfulness. It tells you, you're going to make these types of efforts. How? Through mindfulness. And what is it you're going to do with mindfulness? You're going to remove the hindrances. That's the primary function of mindfulness. Mindfulness is not merely paying attention. If you don't have this clear... The four foundations of mindfulness can look quite complicated since it seems that numerous things are going on. You're watching the body, the feelings, the mind, and then the dhamma structures. Do you do it all at once, or do you do it sequentially, or what? Do you stay with one? I think the answer will be much more clear if you remember the refrain, just to the extent necessary for overcoming covetousness and grief for the world, just to the extent necessary for overcoming the hindrances. Why are you inspecting the body? For what purpose? Is it to know the nine stages of decomposition of the corpse, in case you have to write an exam on it, or work at a coroner's office, or go into forensics? No, it's not for that reason. It's for overcoming covetousness and grief for the world. When you examine the body, ask yourself, why would the body produce covetousness and grief for the world? Ask yourself that question, and it starts to make sense. The Buddha is asking you to see that the ordinary way that we look at bodies causes us grief and sorrow and problems. So we have to look at them in a different way, so that we don't have the grief and the sorrow there. We recognize the body's transience. Then, when we do experience transformations of the body, and even ultimately death, we don't see it as a big problem. We see it as the nature of the body. If I can remember that, I will be treating it correctly so that the experience of the body and having a body doesn't lead to grief and sorrow. Again now with the sensations, the feelings, pleasant, neutral, and painful, 
and also recognizing spiritual and bodily feelings, worldly and unworldly, we're looking at them just so that they don't lead us into a condition of grief. Ask yourself, when have I felt a bit sad or bereft or covetous? When have I felt that I wanted something back? When has a feeling slipped away on me and I wanted it back? In those cases, I was covetous. Wherever it came from out in the world, whatever object that it came from, or the feeling itself, I want that thing. I covet it. Or I grieve at its presence or its absence. How could I avoid that? I'm enjoying an experience. Should I not have the experience? No, you just have to see that watching a pleasant experience, I want it to last. And watch that wanting. Try to acknowledge the reality of the experience and just say, it doesn't last. It won't last. Do this right in the middle of the experience. Then check to see how you feel afterwards, after it departs. Note whether you're surprisingly okay, not feeling regretful. It's not about taking all the fun out of the world or taking pleasant feelings away. And of course, you can't ultimately remove unpleasant feelings either. But it is about handling these skillfully, carefully. Then the bumps are smoothed out, resulting in a huge reduction in the amount of suffering. I don't know what the formula would be, but it's probably 98% less suffering than I would have had if I hadn't reflected, it doesn't last, it won't last. 98% is not bad. This doesn't have to be super normal. You just do it enough that it starts to take on a life of its own. It pops up almost by itself. Right in the middle of a situation, you get some insight. There it goes again. Right, that was the last cookie. That's how you know that the potential for mundane, regular suffering in the ordinary curve of the day has been reduced. The ordinary person could reduce their suffering by 50%. I used to have a little formula. I used to ask people, how do you like to cut your suffering by 50% in five years? Sound good? It's entirely possible. No enlightenment necessary. No jhana necessary. 50% cut. I don't tell them five days. Five years. 50%. It's doable. If you're a keen student, it could be more. You could certainly reduce the mundane, ordinary texture of the day's suffering by huge quantities, even 80 to 90%. You might still suffer when the crunch comes and the hard stuff happens, the dramatic stuff. You might feel that, but your recovery will be much faster. This is the benefit of working on the hindrances when you look at the body or the feelings. Then you look at the mind as, what is the mind, angry or not, greedy or not, confused or not, exalted or not, expansive or contracted, just to the extent necessary for helping you let go of this grabbing on and pushing away. There's a huge confusion around this. The Buddha never talks about allowing negative and positive mental states to come through and just watch them, allowing them to be and to pass away. He doesn't talk about it in that way. When you have a negative state such as anger, you are grasping. Anger and attachment are the same thing, with just a little more detail as to what it is to be attached. You're not detached from anger, ever. Anger is a specific type of attachment. The Buddha says, let go of anger, let go of it. You can't watch anger dispassionately. You are passionately involved in it. You're passionately attached. And mindfulness is primarily around the removal of the five hindrances. And this is something to be handled quickly and deliberately. That's what right effort is. Those are the instructions. Now go do it. And how do you do it? Where are you going to find these five hindrances? In the body or your relationship to the body. 
in the feelings or your relationship to the feelings and in mental states, but not in your relationship to mental states, in the mental states themselves. If you have anger, you don't have a relationship with it. It is the attachment. If you have a feeling, you can have a relationship to the feeling. You can have pain and be detached. You can have pleasure and be detached. The Buddha has pleasant feelings and painful feelings, but he doesn't have anger. Anger is the attachment. The distinction between mental states and feelings in the body is so confused in so many books and teachings. Feelings in the body can be looked at objectively with detachment. Mental states, however, if they're negative, you're not looking at them with detachment at all. They are functioning as hindrances. In the four foundations of mindfulness, you're looking with informed attention that has a set of instructions to it. The instructions are to rapidly push the buttons to appropriately respond to the situation. In the body, kaya nupasana. In the feelings, vedana nupasana. In the mental states, citta nupasana. And in the dhammas, dhamma nupasana. The dhammas are groupings, and the groupings are almost a repetition of the whole thing. One of the groupings is the five hindrances and your duty towards them. The duty? To remove them. The positive mental states, such as the cultivation of the seven factors of enlightenment, are to be preserved, not removed, and not just watched as they arise and pass away. That's an instruction for something else. Positive mental states are to be sustained and developed. Mindfulness has to have the right instructions for what to do with the contents of the mind. There is both mindfulness of mind and mindfulness of Dhamma categories. When you look at mindfulness of Dhamma categories, it's almost repeating mindfulness of mind. There's anger involved and non-anger involved. There's grief involved and non-grief. But in the Dhamma categories, we see them in an organized structure of hindrances or positive things like the seven factors. And each is to be treated in a specific way in the context of the teachings. When you come to the body and bodily feelings in the four foundations of mindfulness, you watch objectively with detachment. When it comes to mental states, your first duty is to identify what they are. Before you detach from something, you've got to know what it is. And that's not easy. Most people are rather cloudy about what's going on in their minds at any given time. It takes a lot of watching carefully and the use of feeling tone to help you identify the mind state. Anger is always accompanied by a feeling tone that is a different feeling from something like a sprained or cut finger. The feeling tone that accompanies a mental state like anger is characteristically always negative, always painful, and that is its identifying mark. You can't, for instance, have intellectual anger unaccompanied by unpleasant feeling. That's not anger. That's a series of words floating in the mind. So-and-so is evil. If it's not accompanied by unpleasant feeling, it's not anger. Anger is known by its feeling tone. Desire is known by its feeling tone. And confusion is also known by its feeling tone. So you start to recognize these primary feeling tones. Then, when that primary identification has taken place, your mindfulness should be getting sharper and faster. So it shifts over to the next category. What is this in the framework of Dhamma categories? Is this one of the five hindrances, or is it joy? Am I supposed to be afraid of joy? Afraid to attach to joy? Am I supposed to just let it arise and pass away? No. If you do that, it's wrong. Joy, if it's based on spiritual things, is a factor of enlightenment, not to be let go of, but rather maintained and increased. You're not supposed to be walking around in a kind of dead zone of wooden detachment. Such things as joy are primary enlightenment factors and very positive emotions to be sustained and cultivated. When you lose it, 
go back and find it again and create it again. Your mindfulness will tell you what's going on. If you're on to something good, keep it. Keep it. When you begin with the four foundations of mindfulness, it can get awfully complicated. But it's kind of like driving a car with a stick shift or a particular car. And after a while, you get quite good at it. It becomes a single event. It's not a problem then, and you can even have a conversation while driving. This is exactly right. With mindfulness, the camera is on, even in the midst of a conversation. You're watching yourself. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Am I reacting? You can still carry on a conversation. Mindfulness can be present in the midst of the activities of life. In fact, it must be present in the midst of the activities of life. So the function of mindfulness is to rid yourself of the hindrances, and you know that the mindfulness has been successful because you've arrived at the doorstep of the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path, right concentration. The sixth factor, right effort, is the instructions. Remove the hindrances, prevent them from re-arising, sustain any factors of jhana or positive mental states which have arisen. And if any haven't come up yet, go and find them and start bringing them up by using all these suggested strategies. Remembering people who produce a sense of loving kindness, watching your breath, changing the expression on your face, or changing the bodily posture, or listening to a Dhamma talk. This is your positive, proactive attempt to bring up these positive mental states following the instructions in Factor 6. Factor 7, Right Mindfulness, provides the details of the objects that you'll use to do this, to accomplish this. And when you've accomplished this, how do you know you've been successful? Because the hindrances have subsided. You've now passed the seventh factor and you're about to enter the eighth factor. What is the primary requisite for the eighth? Even the beginning, even the edge, the neighborhood of the eighth factor? That hindrances have subsided. Then five positive things have to arise, perhaps in a weak form. It starts with applied and sustained attention to an object. You feel your mind is lifting towards a meditation object. And there is an emotion, joy. Check over the body. Pain is dropping away. The body is not a problem anymore. The quality of the emotive mind is that you're not separating the mind from the heart, from emotional development. Lastly, there is ikagata, meaning one-pointedness, but really better understood as wholeheartedness. You are wholeheartedly involved now in this project. All of you is available. None of you is thinking about something else or distracted. You're immersed. Your whole interest is focused. That's what we're getting at here. So now five things have come up in some weak form. You're attending. You might be wavering a little bit, but you keep setting it back up there, lifting and placing. And it's interesting. It's joyful. There's energy in it. The problematic nature of the body has receded, and you're kind of in love with what you're doing. Love is wholehearted attention, isn't it? As a mother holds her baby, it's a very wholehearted experience, isn't it? That's the characteristic of ekagata, one-pointedness. So that's what mindfulness is, the bridge to concentration, to samadhi. Sometimes it's treated as a thing in itself, as a pure exercise in attention. But it's really part of the path. And then, when you get to even the neighborhood of samadhi, it's at that moment that you can legitimately call yourself a contemplative. It's possible to even call yourself a bhikkhu, even though you're not a monk. When the Buddha was teaching this, he gives credit to somebody who can attain this as being a bhikkhu. Thank you.